Do you know that most agave utensils populations are actually isolated from each other because they grow in what are called sky islands? And did you know that some agave experts even believe that agave populations living on specific ridgelines or peaks deserve to be categorized as their own subspecies? So that's what we're gonna be talking about today, sky islands and their impact on agave utensils evolution. So the part of Las Vegas that most folks are the most familiar with, or at least most folks who don't live here are the most familiar with, is the, the Strip, the Resort Corridor. And the Strip actually sits within Las Vegas Valley, and that valley itself is at about 2,000 feet of elevation above sea level. But surrounding that valley, there are a number of mountain peaks and ridgelines. Notably up to the north, there's Hayford Peak at 9,900 feet in the Sheep Mountain Range. And then to the west of the city, there's Mount Charleston at nearly 12,000 feet of elevation in the Spring Mountain Range, which also includes Red Rock Canyon, which a lot of folks are familiar with. And then to the south of the city, just past Henderson, there's Black Mountain at about 5,000 feet in the McCullough Range. And then to the east of the city, there's Frenchman Mountain at about 4,000 feet and Sunrise Mountain behind it at about 3,300 feet. Working in the late 19th century, naturalist Clinton Hart Merriam actually noticed that these dramatic elevation changes, which are pretty prominent across the desert southwest, actually create different biotic zones. That is, as you go up in elevation, temperatures decrease and precipitation increases, which leads to very, very different plant and animal life at the various elevation levels. Now, he called these different biotic zones life zones, and he noticed that essentially go, climbing up a thousand feet vertically is pretty similar to driving 600 miles to the north. That is the, you know, the, the low valley desert floors are very similar in climate to the Sonoran Desert far to the south of Mexico, while the higher elevation zones are very similar to the Hudson Bay region very far to the north in Canada. The area around Las Vegas actually includes approximately six different types of these life zones. The lowest that we typically see here are the creosote burst edge flats, which occur below 4,000 feet, are extremely hot, can typically get up to and beyond 110 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the summer, and you generally don't see much wildlife or much plant life other than uh, bursage and creosote shrubs. Uh, agave utensis does not grow down this low. Uh, you will see some, some choya and some cylindra puntia, not a whole bunch of it though, and most of the Las Vegas Valley lies at this life zone. One step up from that is the Mojave Desert Scrub Life Zone. And this occurs typically between 4,000 and 5,000 feet. And this is where uh, cactus becomes much more abundant. You typically see stuff like echinocactus, echinocereus. Uh, you'll see, you know, pincushion cactus, various kinds of escobaria and sometimes mammillaria. Uh, you'll see ferro cactus, uh, and of course, cylindra puntia and opuntia, a choya and, and prickly pear. This is also where you start to see the famous uh, Joshua trees, yucca breviafola, as well as a number of other kinds of yucca, including banana yucca. And it's at this level, at about 4,000 feet or so, that agave utensis starts to grow. And then the next life zone up is called the Pinion Juniper Woodland. And that typically is between about 5,000 and 8,000 feet. And you see a lot of you know, short pinion pine and juniper trees. Uh, you see quite a bit of that same cactus that I mentioned before. And you also see quite a bit of agave utensis. In fact, a lot of the photography that I do and post on my various accounts comes from the Pinion Juniper Woodland. And temperatures in this pinion juniper life zone are actually much more moderate. They're rarely above 100 degrees in the summer, and they do get well below freezing in the winter, and in fact, spend quite a bit of the winter covered in snow. And the precipitation in this area generally exceeds eight inches a year, whereas the, the low creosote burst edge flats will typically get under you know, four or five inches a year. Today, agave utensis doesn't seem to grow a whole lot above, say, 7,000, 7,500 feet. Uh, and so there are, you know, essentially uh, three more life zones that occur around Las Vegas. Uh, and I'm not really going to get super detailed into them because, again, I'm focused on, I'm an agave utensis nerd. Um, so I'm focused on where agave utensis grows. 
But these three other uh, life zones are the pine fir forest, the bristlecone forest, and then we actually do get in Las Vegas at the peak of some mountains, like at the peak of Mount Charleston, an alpine tundra zone where you know you're beyond the tree line and, and no more trees go. But again, agave utensis really doesn't grow up into these much higher elevations. It kind of tops out around the pinyon juniper woodland zone at around 7,500, 7,000 feet in elevation or so. These elevated life zones, each with their own unique plant and animal life, are called sky islands because essentially they are moderate temperature, higher precipitation environments that are surrounded by a sea or an ocean of dry, hot desert floor. And so generally plants and animals are confined to these sky islands and don't cross the ocean of desert in between them. In the case of agave utensis, confinement to these isolated sky islands has, has largely produced the effects that we see today where each individual ridge line basically has its own, some experts call them subspecies of agave utensis. In fact, last week when I did an interview with legendary agave breeder Kelly Griffin, he mentioned that he, he thinks that there are individual subspecies confined to specific peaks and ridge lines and outcroppings that are sky islands uh, of agave utensis where you see very specific forms. You can see, you know, blue eborospina or or green nevadensis on very specific uh, sky islands. When you look at all the different populations, and there are many different populations, they're all relatively isolated. There's usually a flat plain between the populations and a limestone cap or a limestone kind of situation where they're kind of locked to it. So if you think of it in those terms, you're not getting a lot of the pollinators going across these vast plains. And if they do, they're not sharing much in terms of genetic material across these areas. So they do tend to stay fairly relatively isolated. And because of that, they develop characteristics that are fitting for their particular niche. And it's up to, I guess, the, the particular taxonomist to decide when is that push great enough that it becomes a species. Generally, it's when they're isolated and separated and there are floral differences. The big problem with most of the Utahensis is there isn't a great deal of floral difference between all the populations. I'm sure that some are bigger plants and they have more robust flowers, but the proportions are still pretty much the same. So to me, they're all the same species, but they're all different subspecies. So I think you probably have one species with five different uh, subspecies, and I could elaborate more on that, but there are a couple forms that Gentry didn't recognize because he just didn't go to all of them. There's that greenish form of Nevidensis that is on the westernmost edge that occurs in those areas. I don't think that that's closely related to uh, uh, the, the southern Nevidensis forms or the Nopa um, Eborospina forms. I, I think that's a different entity. And many of those separate entities, those individual populations of agave utensis live in the sky islands created by those mountain peaks and ranges that surround the Las Vegas Valley, particularly in the sheep range to the north and the spring mountains to the west. And I think that's a large part of the reason for a lot of the species variability in agave utensis, particularly when you travel from sky island to sky island. But this actually probably wasn't always the case. In fact, for much of Earth's history, prior to the end of the last glacial maximum 12,000 or so years ago, uh, much of the world was much cooler and wetter than it is today. Between about 12,900 years ago and 11,700 years ago, there was a global climate event known as the Younger Dryas event. Basically what that was is, as the earth was slowly rising in temperature out of that late last glacial maximum, what most folks call the last ice age, into the warm Holocene epoch that we're in today, the earth's temperature was gradually rising, but the Younger Dryas event was a very dramatic and rapid cooling period of, you know, about a thousand years or so uh, when the earth cooled off considerably and then afterwards got back to resuming that, that warming that led into the, uh, the Holocene epoch that we're in today. And before that Younger Dryas event, here in the desert southwest, minimum winter temperatures were something like 15 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than they are today. And researchers studying fossilized pack rat droppings found in the Grand Canyon. And pack rats are a, a rodent that will basically eat almost any kind of plants that are around, but love to eat agave utensis where it is available to them, have found that uh, they can trace these uh, historic climate changes based on where the agave utensis 
remains uh, are found in these fossilized pack rat droppings and when in time those pack rat droppings were made. And what they found is that before the Younger Dryas event, Agave Utensis was actually present in significant quantities below 3,000 feet. And during that really cold Younger Dryas event, uh, Agave Utensis was actually found in pretty significant quantities below 2,000 feet. Today, it basically only occurs, like I said, above 4,000 feet because of the much warmer climate we have today. And this lower potential range for Agave Utensis would have, of course, meant much more, many more opportunities for individual populations of Agave Utensis today that are isolated into specific sky islands and specific peaks and ridges uh, to cross-pollinate and interact with each other. And it would probably have also allowed for the potential uh, hybridization of Agave utensis or Agave utensis subspecies Caba bensa specifically with other species of agave, likely agave like agave deserti or agave mckelviana. And I go into this in more depth in my agave utensis history video, but most experts believe that agave utensis, or at least the subspecies utensis, uh, variety nevadaensis, and variety uh, eborospina are likely the result of a field hybridization between agave utensis subspecies cababensis and then some other undefined parent agave like deserti or mckelviana. But if you want more information on that, go check out the agave utensis history video. So I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Uh, have you ever visited agave utensis in one of these sky islands? And do you agree with Kelly that these individual sky island populations uh, may be different enough from the rest of the taxa, the rest of the kinds of agave utensis to warrant uh, separation into their own subspecies? Thanks for watching.